few of these men who survived come with, with good competence. They are men now of 75 or so, and they're still on the firing line. The few of these are carrying the whole load. And during this whole period of Lysenko, uh, there were no people trained in conventional genetics and plant breeding. Um, so there's a big gap. And this is one of the things that holds back their whole agricultural mm -hmm. development. Of course, there are many other things. Lack of fertilizers, certainly mm -hmm. uh, way up the top of the pile. Uh, but uh, I have a feeling that through food, this is one of the best bonds with uh, other countries of other ideologies. We can understand each other perfectly well at the scientific level so long as we we're dealing with uh, these things that are basic to, to all human needs. Uh, similarly, uh, we've been working informally with Algeria in the last uh, few months. We hope to be able to give them a hand in a little more formal way in the next uh, six months, starting perhaps late summer. We have three Algerians with us at the present time. Did the Russians ask for some of your Mexican? <coughs> yes, they have, uh, they have quite a few. I, I think they've got a lot of them uh, from India, and we've sent them uh, much of our breeding material. But I think that uh, uh, they need to develop the agronomy. They don't know how to grow these things, and here again you They have pretty good wheat varieties themselves, don't they? Well, these kinds that uh, stand bad conditions, the same kind as the old land races, but when you start fertilizing such a thing, it's a... Uh, no. It's kind of like having a Model T Ford, uh, or let's put it no. the other way around. It's like having a 1971 Cadillac, and you put in that old gasoline of uh, how many octanes that we used to run the T on. It just doesn't work there, very we? good. Uh, Are we headed back to that? Well, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Barlow, uh, I thought you made some rather interesting statements uh, in your lecture this evening about uh, uh, the use of pesticides and fertilizers uh, uh, at this time. At, um, would you care to uh, elaborate on this a bit and tell us how you feel about uh, restriction on the use of fertilizers and pesticides? Well, I think in the case of uh, fertilizers, I think it's pretty evident to anyone who sits back and thinks uh, uh, about this that uh, you wouldn't have an agricultural economy or a prosperous agriculture such as that in the USA had it not been for chemical fertilizer. Uh, the old way we did things pretty largely with the rotations of the cereals and, uh, and legumes uh, up to a point was effective, but we would never have achieved the, the yields that we achieve on our best farms now without the use of the right kind and the right dosages of uh, chemical fertilizers. And it also, of course, has uh, reduced per unit cost of production. So, and then uh, to make the situation, to bring it out uh, as it relates to the rest of the world. Now, I think probably for a few years, if somebody just foolishly said, well, you can't use chemical fertilizer anymore, the U.S. would probably not starve to death immediately, put all of this land back in production. Fire should get rich. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. Uh, people would so have to get... Eddie's studies show. Uh, if you'd scare them well enough in the cities, you know, you see in the... Uh, we got, what, four and a half percent of the people on farms now? Something in that order? Less than five, at least. Isn't that yes. right, Dr. Hedy? About four percent right. of the workforce and about less than five percent of the people live okay. on farms. Uh, and you know a good share of those urbanites, especially in the large cities, they, they don't know where this food comes from. They think it comes from the supermarkets. <laughs> That's right. There's uh, kind of a rule of thumb here you might use, how to make everybody better off. One, if we use somewhat less fertilizer, in production we're less, demand is inelastic, a smaller amount sells for more, brings in a greater total revenue, that would increase farmers' income in the United States, then we could ship more fertilizer to underdeveloped countries. People die early because of malnutrition, their lifespan would increase. I say there might be an in-between spot here where you make everybody better off. And help us but just, on our problem with uh, polluting the environment at the same time. Just think of trying to implement that kind of a practice. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a lovely job to be placed in charge of this unless you're an absolute it, dictator? It, it should be easier to ration fertilizer than to try to ration land the way we're doing now. That's a well, very complicated and inefficient way. Well, uh, let me take the, uh, the other side of this picture. 
fertilizer in the hungry world. You affluent people here, well, you've got some alternatives still, but you see, in the hungry <laughs> nations, they have none. That soil's worn out as far as plant nutrient availability is concerned. You can't change the yield measurably, no matter how you change the agronomic practice and uh, how you change the variety and how you control the diseases because the oh, yes, diseases... Oh, yes, it's certainly part of, part of their advantage. When I say you can step up life expectancy by overcoming malnutrition, even if you ran it up to the place where you endangered their health because of intake and chemicals and so on, you'd still make them better off, you'd still extend their life. And also, there's no easier way to substitute for land for them than fertilizer. I think if you analyze all this material you can get your hand on, it shows that about a ton of fertilizer substitutes for about 50 acres of land as typically cultivated world around. So I say there's, for an undeveloped country, everything may be Makes sense. fine. Uh, but you see, also, uh, everybody's concerned, uh, much more so than I, about the use of chemical fertilizers uh, in big quantities. You know, people are living longer today than ever before, despite all of these things. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, few a lot other of factors uh, involved. <laughs> yes, and I, I think that it, for anyone who starts pointing a finger at the use of chemical fertilizers uh, at the levels that uh, in the developing world that they can economically supply is just whistling in the dark. This is a financial Nobody's impossibility. Doing that. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Some of my very best critics have been very vociferous in this uh, in scientific About publications that using these heavy doses of fertilizer, we must be contaminating all the rivers and this sort of thing, and it's ridiculous. I was well, first uh, nothing, in nothing is much more contaminated than biologically than the atmosphere in India. You can't go there and eat any fresh vegetables or drink any unboiled water with the organic fertilizer they use on fields. I would certainly feel that it's a little safer for everybody to use chemical fertilizers. See, I think that people now, the ecologists, many of the purest, I'm not talking about the average ecologist, and I started out as an ecologist, a forest ecologist, forestry and uh, watershed management and wildlife management, and then I worked for a chemical uh, research organization for a number of years, and I had... Could I, I inject worked. something here that I think is marvelous? Was that the organization that you, where you threatened to quit if they wouldn't yeah. allow you the freedom to use the laboratories at night um, and on holidays? Yes, ma'am. This was during the war years. Sidelight. Uh, you see, uh, you're looking at one of the first guys that had DDT up to his ears and arms and when we knew very little about this. Uh, I'm still alive and I'm still pretty mean. And I don't expect to die from DDT poisoning very mm -hmm. soon. And I think that uh, what's going on here is that uh, a lot of people are calling wolf before there's very much uh, evidence to, to show wolf. I'll admit that a uh, long uh, uh, DDT uh, type of uh, pesticide, which is persistent and survives as such, the molecules do for a long period of time, can get into the food chains and some of these uh, birds that live you especially off water. You don't know what it'll do to the next generation of people either. Well, oh, I, I think there's pretty good evidence about this. This is just a lot of silliness about the mutagenic effects that are going on, all sorts of things. It's very difficult to produce uh, these kinds of changes. Too much has been said about uh, this without any real good evidence. Not only in the case of DDT, but in many of the others. Well, well you're, you're on both sides. I mean, if, if you don't know, you don't know either way. Anybody who's tried to pr pr uh, provoke uh, mutations uh, wouldn't simplify to the point where these kinds of dosages that are being used is likely to produce monsters in the human species. I think this for, is for, you, for your for your critics of an undeveloped country. I think they're looking at it only in a one-sided sense, and I think there's a set of trade-offs, maybe perhaps between chemical pollution and biological pollution. You maybe you have to find the right balance of the thing. I say I would still think for an undeveloped country such as India, biological pollution without any chemicals is much more dangerous to mankind than everything there else and chemical. There are choices there than you do here. Uh, I, I would disagree with you. I'm sorry, Mr. Soth. I just can't <laughs> buy your negative point of view on well, use my, of chemical... My, my point of view chemical, is positive. Uh, <laughs> chemical <laughs> fertilizers. Well, I say I'm talking for, for mankind. You people here are very privileged people indeed. And you can afford to have these kinds of uh, points of view. But this 
very program will probably go halfway around the world and it'll be used to say, you see what happens in the USA? And now you're advocating this kind of an approach for our country, but it's not good enough for the USA. This is psychologically ruinous to any program to try to help these people from the standpoint of solving their food problems. Well, I would say that it would be uh, foolish uh, in uh, India, for example, to go heavily into livestock because they can't afford to convert it. Uh, the grains as much as we can. Right. There's a difference between the two countries. And right. I think there's a difference in in the policy uh, that you take on use of uh, pesticides, for example, in in two different <coughs> countries with different of kinds of problems. Sure, and, and it's uh, always a question of taking the plus benefits and the minus and the net. And, 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 yeah, that's all and you I'm see saying. in the case of DDT, uh, you've got to remember what it did and malaria control worldwide. That's a pretty big plus. And it'll outweigh a lot of the minus. There's no good substitute, even up to this late time. In the case of uh, DDT uh, on co many cotton insects, there's no, presently, there's no good uh, active substitute. More people are killed right now, but good and fast, with the organic phosphates, especially in, in uh, the developing countries, and certainly has happened with DDT, and they're killed fast. Maybe this is good, but I think it's tragedy. Uh, not to uh, change the subject, because it's all part of the same uh, subject package here, but uh, we haven't, we've talked about production, we've talked about the population control, about pesticides. There's another angle as a uh, plant breeder, however, that concerns me in uh, much of what's being done in countries where green revolutions are going on. Uh, when you bring in a new wheat variety that has the capabilities of uh, responding to irrigation, to increase fertilizer, and so forth this way, of course, uh, immediately it replaces to a very great extent and very rapidly the indigenous varieties that we have in these places. Now, over uh, the period of time for the future, the plant breeders, you and I and plant pathologists who work in these areas were dependent entirely upon what we call germplasm banks. Now, these are simply reservoirs that are either uh, being reproduced naturally, like the wild oat species are being reproduced in Israel at the present time in the deserts, or uh, they may be very large collections which are perpetuated in storage, special storage conditions, as we have at the National Laboratory in Fort Collins, Colorado. Or they may just be a series of collections which are grown uh, sufficiently uh, periodic to, to maintain the viability of the seed stocks. Now, when you move into an area like India and so on, uh, or um, some <coughs> other places, you certainly supplant uh, many different genetic types. Now, this happened to us in the Corn Belt when the hybrid corn took over here so rapidly in the early 40s. And uh, except for by the foresight at that time, and I might say lucky foresight, really, of some of the breeders in some of these states, uh, all of the old corns were fed to the pigs up to the last ear. See, Once you had lost that reservoir of germplasm, that product of thousands and perhaps millions of years of evolution, those genes are lost forever, essentially. Now, what's being done uh, on a worldwide basis? I know what's being done with my own crop, which happens to be the, the oat crop. Uh, what's being done internationally to try to preserve some of this for the future generations of plant breeders, if you like, as raw material with which to combat these diseases biologically that we know are going to change, to improve the quality of the grain, to meet the new fertilizer uh, applications that are going to go on? Fight well, insects. Fight insects. I suppose the, the, in the case of wheat, <coughs> the largest single collection viable seed in the world is in the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, store in Fort Collins. It has and some 15 is, or 18,000. It must have uh, all of 18,000 yeah. at the present mm -hmm. time. Uh, this is being added too gradually, but there's a committee representing various organizations to try to expand this in the foreseeable future, the next couple of years. Uh, not only wheat itself, but related species of uh, grasses, uh, progenitors of the wheat species, 
and uh, this, this, as you pointed out uh, very well, Ken, needs to be done, uh, and it needs to be done fast. Of course, India was really outside of the zone of origin of wheat, as way out in the periphery. Um, the areas where you, where you need much more collection are in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, uh, as far as Israel, and then the secondary origin in the case of wheat in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, I rather doubt that there's adequate uh, sampling. This is why this committee is supposed to make a recommendation, and I think it'll probably be funded in this next year to Well, what's this. what's the possibility? Uh, Dr. Browning brought up an interesting point uh, today when we were <coughs> discussing this. What's the possibility of leaving this as a natural herbarium, so to speak? In other words, uh, we, we have some natural prairies that we're protecting in Iowa because we want to sort of see what they were like. Now, we're not doing it for perpetuation of germplasm on the prairie at this point in time, but we're doing it so that our children and their children's children can see what the prairie was like back in the very early days, you see, before man invaded and took this all over and supplanted those first species. What about the natural uh, herbaria? Uh, this is being done naturally with the, uh, the old species in Israel, but I don't know whether well, we can afford this or... Just another aspect of that population problem, only in this case it's both man and goats. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Between them, why, there won't be any natural uh, uh, wild species in their zones of origin. Each time they're worked over more viciously, as there are more people and need for more. Man goats. chases the goats up the mountain a little farther each time. So, um, <laughs> I, I, in those densely populated areas uh, that are already overgrazed, uh, I, I don't think this is uh, going to be the solution. There are many countries who have made local collections. They have poor facilities for storage. FAO has made one collection on Durham's that's stored in Turkey. And of course, one of the uh, very large collections going back again to the late 20s and 30s was uh, Vavilov's in Russia. Most of this collection presumably was lost uh, when he no longer existed. Some of it remains. I think the corn people, though, working the corn project with your cement, uh, have made rather extensive collections, haven't yes. they, in Latin America? Oh, yes. Uh, I think that uh, there's a good representative collection of uh, most of the unimproved mesas from Mexico south, including in the islands of the Caribbean. Could I uh, change the subject uh, briefly? Uh, in your uh, lecture tonight, you mentioned the uh, prejudice of the Indian people against uh, a red wheat and uh, they wanted a white wheat uh, and uh, food prejudices generally and it made me uh, wonder about the situation in rice. I understand that this uh, Philippine uh, rice is still not very acceptable <coughs> in uh, the rice eating uh, areas of India. Is that true? No, the original IR8, this would be true. Uh, this is Japanese-type sticky, gooey, uh, kind you eat with chopsticks instead of the dry-cooking uh, rices that are preferred in the Indian Southeast Asia. But many of the newer varieties that are coming out, like IR6 and 20, this is uh, more of the uh, Indian-type as far as cooking quality is concerned. And you see, uh, uh, this is this sort of second echelon problem that's being corrected. Maintaining the high yield of the original type that was widely distributed and it, which is only adapted incidentally to areas where you have a lot of sunshine. You see if you move IR8 into the dripping tropics, uh, heavy summer rainfall or monsoon rains, there are a whole series <coughs> of diseases that will decimate it. It's not adapted to those environments, but uh, newer types are being uh, developed, are already in commercial uh, production, which take care of uh, some areas where IR8 is not adapted, and this will be... Uh, that, that's a bigger problem than the palatability, is it? Well, I would say uh, the disease thing, of course, uh, has to be corrected first when you go into these, and uh, insect problems also, into these uh, heavy rainfall areas. This is where you get into lots of trouble on diseases, and IR8 just can't go there from that standpoint, quite apart from the uh, question of quality. But uh, the quality thing, I think uh, they're making good progress on this. And of course, you see, the, the institutes are never meant to be substitutes for the national breeding programs or research stations. They're simply to be 
additional help behind these to try to build the strong national programs, whether it's in reese or wheat or rice uh, in India or any other crop, or in Pakistan and all of the countries. We try to build in uh, technical know-how through trained people and uh, feeding in materials, but they've got to carry the large amount of the responsibility, and we Do help, you help have as much as hope as for can. African crops? Uh, I think, think that uh, uh, in the case of, it uh, uh, depends on where you are in Africa, you've got a whole system of, of situation of different surroundings, but we're making good progress. In the uh, south and west. Along the north rim in wheat, and it can be, and in the east. Uh, in the south, or in uh, tropical Africa, I think that there will be good progress in corn and sorghums, and in some areas where rice is uh, eaten, I, there's good possibility there, but rice isn't uh, in most parts of Africa preferred fo food. Corn and sorghum would be more to their liking and easier to, easier to expand. Gentlemen, we will be back for the conclusion of tonight's program after this message. On September 22nd, 1960, this ship steamed out of San Francisco Harbor bound for Indonesia. In dimension and performance, she was a common American steamship, except, except for the fact that in her hold was a milk plant. We ever had. And this is the last portion of our program, and as is not usually our practice with Dimension 5, usually we keep on talking until the wee small hours, but Dr. Borlaug has had a very hard day and has an early morning plane to catch. Where do you go? I'm now. going back to West Mexico, to Sonora, state of Sonora tomorrow. Will you be out getting your hands dirty and... Mm, hope so. ...and in the fields? <laughs> there were a number of questions that our viewers had, and I regret so much that we're not able to talk with you longer. But it has been a real pleasure having you as our guest tonight. Lauren Soth, it's been marvelous to have you. And the other gentleman I see more frequently on the Iowa State University campus, Stalwarts Hall. And for our viewers, thank you very much for being with us. Join us again next week for Dimension 5.